Hi, I'm Martin Pritikin, the Dean of Purdue Global Law School, the nation's first fully online law school. Welcome to this latest installment in our Distinguished Speaker webinar series titled The Mind of a Serial Killer. This is a fascinating topic, and there are few more qualified to speak about it than our featured guest today, Dr. Joni Johnston. Dr. Johnston is a psychologist, expert witness, and author with decades of experience studying serial killers and criminal deviants. She's worked in prisons for the Board of Parole for the Superior Court of San Diego, and she's been retained as an expert and a consultant by both prosecutors and criminal defense attorneys. She often conducts competency to stand trial and insanity evaluations, as well as risk assessments for mentally disordered offenders. She's the host and producer of uh, the YouTube channel Unmasking a Murderer. She has a podcast called The Forensic Psychologist and a newsletter called The Mind Detective that explores the psychology of true crime. She consults with true, tr true crime television shows and has been featured on Investigation Discoveries, A Crime to Remember. Um, and last but not least, she's the author of, of among other books, Serial Killers, 101 Questions True Crime Fans Ask. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Well, I've been looking forward to it for several weeks now. So thanks for having me. Great. And just to let you and the audience know, um, you can feel free to um, post uh, questions in the Q&A box. And uh, we've got a lot of questions of our own, but time permitting, we'll try and weave some of those into the discussion as well. So Dr. Johnson, let's start off with a definition. What is the definition of a serial killer and how does that differ from a mass killer or a spree killer? A serial killer really is, is, is a much simpler definition of one that you might think. So when we think about a serial killer, we're thinking about motives, we're thinking about all different kinds of things, but really it's based on, on number. A serial killer is basically someone who has killed two people in separate instances. And as you can imagine, that's a pretty, again, a pretty broad uh, number of people that could potentially fit that bill. Um, you know, we, we tend to kind of to think that it's just, you know, that all serial killers are kind of alike, that they all look like Ted Bundy, they all look like Richard Ramirez. In other words, that's just one subset when we're talking about serial killers. And um, so, for example, Brian Koberger, right, the Idaho killer from uh, about a year ago, would he qualify as a serial killer? So Brian Koberger, if he is guilty, and of course he has not been convicted of anything yet, would be considered a mass murderer because he killed at least four people in a single instance. And that's really the, the difference between we're talking about serial killer or mass killer. There must be a four person or more, and it must happen at one period of time. And a spree killer kind of bridges that or blurs that line between mass killer and um, serial killer. Is that right? It really does. As a matter of fact, the FBI has pretty much done away with this idea of spree killers because they've said, let's just call them all serial killers because it does happen, you know, in more than one occasion. There are other people who've said no. You know, there are patterns of murders that kind of fit together with each other. There's not this cooling off period, but it is more than one victim. And so we're going to call them spree killers. So there's some controversy over how you kind of label that. Um you know, depending upon, again, how you want to define it. But I think for our purposes, I think we would just call it really that somebody is a serial killer, you know. Um, Makes sense. Um, now, serial killers get a lot of attention, uh, or at least the topic does. But in terms of the actual number of killings that are committed by serial killers, as opposed to the overall number of murders, what's the proportion there? Well, again, all you have to have is two, right? You have to have two murderers at separate um, and separate occasions to be a serial killer. And that has changed since 2005. Before that, you had to have three different victims um, in separate occasions. And so there's a lot of, again, questioning as well, why? You know, why did it used to be you had to have three and now you only have to have two? And I think the best explanation for that is that the FBI wanted to be able to get more involved earlier on in some of these cases. And they said, OK, let's just if we define serial killer more narrowly or, or more broadly where people can kind of come in, then we'll be asked. It'll be OK for us to come in more often. And that's the reason. And the reality is most people who murder only murder one person. So if you've right. murdered, you know, if you've, more, if you've murdered people uh, more than once, that in and of itself is a pretty distinguishing um, feature. 
And is there an estimate, though? I mean, in terms of uh, the number of killings uh, committed by someone who kills more than once, is it around 1%, 10%, 50%? Do they have an estimate of that? So ask me what that question one more time, Martin. I'm not sure. Sorry, there's yeah. A bunch so, of different, no, there's a bunch of different questions there. Let me make sure I understand them. So, yeah, no problem, right? So the idea is of all the murders that occur in America, let's say, I don't know, 10,000 murders a year, um, how many murders are actually committed by serial killers? Is it a tiny fraction? Is it half? Okay. It is very rare. I mean, probably yeah. less than 1% of murderers right. in the United States have been committed by serial killers. Um, and I think, you know, again, by far most, most killers um, only kill one person. So that right. in and of itself is gonna set, set it out. And to put that in context, how many murders or homicides are committed by a family member of the victim? Well, I mean, we know that, you know, family and camera, you know, we, we, we all get freaked out about strangers, right? Stranger danger. We tell people this, right? Right. You know, watch your children, which I mean, not that we shouldn't do that, but I think we all know that really the people that we have to be the most concerned about oftentimes are the people that we share a bed with or we share a room with or whatever. And so when we talk about people um, who are more, most likely to hurt family members, it is those family members. Hmm. So certainly when you're talking about, you know, um, I mean, you know, again, when you're talking about different motives and different things that happen, um, we, you know, we certainly know that who is most likely to get hurt or to, get, to hurt somebody. It's yeah. somebody that they know. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Um, so is there a demographic of the typical serial killer? Is there such a thing? There used to be, um, you know, this idea that a serial killer was a man, which we do know is that is probably the one thing that we can bank on in terms of statistics. About 8.6% of serial killer killers are women at this point. So they're, it's very a male dominated, um, I don't want to say profession, but it's a male dominated field. Yeah. Um, it is a very, um, you know, male dominated field. Um, I'm trying to think what else we're going to say about that. Um, so we know it's mostly males. Do we know anything about age, race, profession, anything like that? Um, do we know anything about age? Profession? We know that, um, you know, mid twenties uh, is something that, you know, we see a lot when you think about violence, what do we think about young people? Right. So we yeah. know that um, the, the average age for a serial killer is about 28 when they start their killing career. Um, we used to think that there was it was mainly um, Caucasians. We know now that over the past 10 to 20 years, we've had more African-American um, serial killers. So now that's about a 50 50 split. Interesting. Um, which, you know, again, it's kind of interesting in terms of why that is. We're not quite sure. Huh. Um, but, you know, so w again, this idea that, you know, they didn't have any, uh, they didn't have any, um, uh, you know, they weren't an employee. They didn't have any education. They, there used to be all these ideas of what it meant to be a serial killer. These are people who are, who are not necessarily poor, but they're uneducated. They're loners. They can't get along with other people. Um, you know, they they're misfits, basically. You know, the people, and that's really not the case. Um, it's something that we really have to kind of, you know, kind of really um, look in, in, and kind of figure out what is the myth versus the reality when we're talking about some of these things. Well, so I, I think it's interesting, you know, you said 8.6% of serial killers are women. Uh, you know, it's actually surprising to me that it's that high. I would have thought 99% of serial killers were men. But it may be because I have a certain conception about motive. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think we usually think as the, the sexual predator, as the typical serial killer. Do we know roughly what percentage of serial killings are motivated by, you know, sexual deviance or sexual desires? In men, it's about a third. Um, money seems to be the predominant motive in both men and women, although much more so in women than in men. About 70% of female serial killers um, seem to be motivated by money. And that's about 30% by men. So there's sure. a huge discrepancy there. And of course, when you talk about motives, then you're talking about different victims pools, right? You're talking about who the victims are likely to be. Uh, how are they likely to kill them? 
Are they likely to strangle somebody if you're a female serial killer? It's happened, but it certainly is not likely to happen. You're more likely to see more physically aggressive ways of killing people if it's a man. So when you start talking about some of those things, you start seeing some real differences in how male and female serial killers tend to operate. Is there a preferred way that women typically kill their victims? Well, women are much more likely to poison them. Now, there's a myth. There's this whole idea about women. I mean, poison is a love story and all those kinds of things. And, um, you know, certainly I think we find that, um, you know, an overrepresentation of poison as a murder weapon. When we're talking about women for sure. Um, huh. It tends to be kind of what we call covert violence as opposed to overt violence. And so right. when you're, you know, and oftentimes you have people who might be physically less powerful. I mean, there's reasons why people choose the methods that they do. Also, if you have more access to food, for example, you have access to somebody, you know, because if you're going to poison somebody, you're more likely to poison somebody that you know. You're bumping right. off a spouse for insurance money, or you're getting rid of your children because, um, you know, your new boyfriend doesn't want them. I mean, these are horrible things to even think about, but these are other ways that people, you know, become serial killers, but huh. those aren't who we think about, right? When we think about serial killers. We're thinking about, again, you know, the, the, the stereotypical of John Wayne Gacy. And, you know, you think there were five serial killers in the whole world because these are the same ones we keep naming off every time. Right. 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 Uh, so are, are female serial, serial killers ever motivated by sex? Does that, does that happen? I mean, there's, it, it, it's almost as non-existent. I mean, there's just not much evidence for it. There are some people who said, well, Aileen Wuornos, um, this right. was a serial killer. She was the first, you know, um, she was the first female serial killer, which is absurd because, I mean, you know, that's been going on for 100, 150 years when you've seen women. As a matter of fact, in 1900, the percentage of women who were of serial killers who were women was about 30 percent. Wow. So we have seen an incredible drop off percentage wise in terms of the number of female serial killers. Now, why do you think that we don't know exactly why, but why do you think that might be the case? Um. I mean, I would off the top of my head say that women's roles in society were much more circumscribed mm -hmm. and um, they may have resorted to, to poisoning people more often to get out of their circumstances. Is that? That's that's as good of it. I mean, I think that really is the prevailing theory. That's kind of an argument that, you know, women's lib is men's lib, too, in this situation. <laughs> right. Because if you couldn't own property, if you couldn't inherit things or those kinds of things, then, you know, 1900, there might be uh, fewer avenues to, you know, to exercise your power. Um, you know, and again, you know, 100 years from now versus how things are now. And so it is fascinating, I think, to look and kind of go, you know, if the percentage wise, it was 30 percent. Now it's less than 10 percent. Huh. Um you know, that kind of speaks to the fact that 70% of females are killers. Money is a primary motive. And if you have more access to money, then, you know, serial, serial widowhood might not be the number one, you know, right. the number one choice. Right. Um, now, what about a sort of a unique, I think, type of serial killer, which is the healthcare worker, right? The so-called, you know, mercy killings or angels of death. Uh, among the realm of serial killers, how often is is that the type of killing we see? Well, it's interesting. We don't know exactly how often it is, right? I mean, that's one of the hard things when you're talking, especially when you're talking about covert uh, violence, and that would certainly be one of them. Um, you know, we can talk about the ones who got caught, but we don't really know a lot of times, you know, mm -hmm. how prevalent is it in healthcare? I mean, one of the things we do is some of, no, is some of the ones that have been caught recently went from place to place, you know, yeah. for years. And, you know, it, it's astounding to see sometimes people that would, you know, get either, you know, get fired from one place and go to the next, or they were suspected of killing the, you know, people, but they just passed along to the next place. And so we don't know how often it is. It's pretty scary, um, but we definitely know that it happens. Do we know who was the, uh, obviously this would only apply to people who've been caught, but do we know who the most prolific serial killer was and how long they operated before they got caught? We do know to date, it's a relatively new one. Um, oh gosh, I'm going to say um, Samuel Little is probably the person who uh, to date has been 
over 60 murders have been verified and wow. 93 uh, seem to be the most common um, number that, that he suspected in the United States. Huh. Yes. Wow. Um, and um, there were some really not unusual, but this was somebody who was extremely transient, who committed murders in at least 11 different states. Wow. Um, and so, you know, this is not somebody who is ge geographically limited, like sometimes you see when people stay tend to say geographically in the comfort zone. I mean, this is obviously somebody who was comfortable killing wherever he he was. Yeah. Um, and how long did he operate before he was caught? Do we know? He started 30 years at least. At wow. least 30 years, if not longer. Oh, huh. that's amazing. Um, so speaking of him traveling through 11 states, I did want you to ask you a, a geographic question. Um, how does U.S. compare to the rest of the world in terms of the frequency that we have serial killers? It's about 3,600 to about 185. I mean, it's really, it's it's astonishing. I mean- Wait, 3,600 in America? Yes, Versus 185 in the rest of the world? Yes. Wow. The number of serial killers, I mean, well over, you know, we've had about 65% of the serial killers in the world, in the United States. So it's like, it really is like, I'm, I'm going to make up the specific um, numbers, but it's like 1,000, 1,500 to 30. I mean, that that is a comparison. It is that, astonishing. Is the, the, why is that the case? Is the drop off is like you? this, you know, it's like, like jumping off of a cliff. Um, do, do we have any, are there theories as to why the U.S. is so disproportionately represented with, with this problem? You know, um, we psychologists have a theory for everything. It's hard to just know, you know, how much of it is is accurate. And um, because we know, for example, that the United States is not the most violent country you know, right. it might make sense if, OK, well, you know, we have the most serial killers because we're the most violent country. And we're not. We're about we have kind of fall in the average range when you look at different measures of violence, you know, across countries. The yeah. only theory and, and I'm not saying it makes a whole lot of sense, but it's probably beats anything else is that, you know, culturally, we are a very independent country. We are a very ambitious country. And so it's almost like um go big or go home in a weird kind of way that, that, you know, I mean, there's a whole issue of guns. There's a whole, there's a whole issue of a lot of different things that, you know, culturally, but, but one of them I think is this idea of not just being, you know, if I'm going to be violent, I'm going to be the most violent person. Um, and so it's kind of odd to think that, but because otherwise you're kind of going, why is it that, you know, violence in the United States kind of falls in the, in the middle range of when you look at different countries and yet there yeah. is just, just, amazingly um disproportionate number of serial killers in the united states versus huh. other you know industrialized countries and, and the u.s is relatively unique in the western world in terms of its approach to private gun ownership but i take it the majority of serial killings are, are not necessarily committed with guns are they guns interestingly enough now depending upon what the motive is and those kinds of things guns still do edge out um, other weapons or other forms of murder. It's funny, we don't hear about them but that often. But I, I did see kind of a comment, which I want to think really applaud the person for saying that, because it's not just that, you know, they're kind of the good, you know, go big or go home or whatever. It's also the, the means to catch people, right? It's the means to investigate. It's the, it's those kinds of things. And, and I think that's, I, I just kind of saw that flash by there and thought, you know, it is very important, you know, when we are a country that does have resources and can investigate and those kinds of things. And so we don't know, you know, perhaps the reason we have so many that are listed out or whatever is because we are able to track them down and catch them. You know, right. we don't know how many are out there that we don't catch. Right. And so it's possible the U.S. is just very, you know, much further along in its investigation techniques and its uh, law enforcement resources to detect and catch serial killers than maybe some other countries are. Absolutely. And I, you know, again, I, I saw that comment. And I thought that's very, very important. So, cause it's not just the, you know, it is very important to, to know that, you know, if you don't catch people, you don't know that you have, you have right. a problem. Now, in terms of historical trends, do I understand it that the, that the percentage of killings, at least in the U S that are committed by serial killers is actually gone down compared to before? 
It has. It definitely has. It, the heyday was, I think, 1986, I think was the most active year that we know. We definitely know the 80s and 90s was kind of the heyday of serial killers. And I think there's some pretty good guesses as to why that's the case. One is there are less available victims, vulnerable victims. So we don't see hitchhikers as much, for example. Um, we see, you know, parents more closely watch their children. There's a lot more awareness of child safety and those kinds of things. Um, so there's, you know, the victim pools, I think, have become more narrow. I think technology has also, um, you know, we're talking about things like forensic investigators, genetic genealogy. Uh, I think those kinds of things make it less likely somebody's going to have the opportunity to kill more than once. Yeah. Um, and so there've been some, I think some things that have kind of come about that have made it more difficult. The other thing that's happened though, which is I think a side effect is that you know, you see other groups who are vulnerable have a larger percentage. So for example, we know that I think in 1990, about, you know, 10 to 15, 10 to 15 percent, up to 20 percent of victims of serial killers were sex workers. Um, now yeah. it's about 43 percent. Wow. And so we've really seen that go up. And I think one theory of that is that that's, a, 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 you know, still a very vulnerable victim pool. Huh. Wow, that's uh, that's very interesting. Um, do you also think it's the case that in the last few decades, mass killings have sort of supplanted serial killings, right? You talked about this idea of, you know, go big or go home, possibly explaining why America uh, has so many serial killers. But of course, you know, we, we see so many mass shootings, unfortunately, in this mm -hmm. country. It seems like every few weeks, there's another one on average. Do you think that theory holds some water that that people who want to make a big impact in a, in a murderous way are just shifting their uh, emphasis? There are several people who think that who've argued that, you know, this person who's now has become a mass uh, murderer would have been a serial killer in 1970 or 1975. I personally don't think that's true. And I think the reason mm -hmm. for that is because you see just such different motives oftentimes operating when you look at serial killers versus, you know, mass shooters or mass murderers. Um, I think a lot of times the dynamics are just different. Um, the, the perpetrators are different. They're oftentimes younger. Um, so, you know, there's no question that culture and zeitgeist and, and the times influence so many things, not just what, how, what we have, what we dress, how we dress, but also how we think and, and what we're angry about and, you know, what we express and those kinds of things. But so there may be some aspect of that, that it's, you know, our focus in terms of what we're angry about or what we focus on or whatever. Um, there may be some overlap there, but I do think there's enough of a difference that, I'm not, I don't believe necessarily that Richard Ramirez, um, who, you know, was the night stalker would have become a mass shooter in, in a high school. I just think okay. there's a different dynamic there. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the motives. Um, we talked about how often, you know, sex versus money is motivation, but, um, in terms of, I guess, root causes, what percentage of serial killers were abused as a child, whether physically, sexually, psychologically, do they have statistics on that? We do have some statistics on that. Um, you know, there oftentimes has to be, need to, needs to be some validation. You know, being a forensic psychologist, I'm always very skeptical in terms of I will take what anybody says to me um, and then I will look for evidence to support or dispute it. And so we know that about 76% of serial killers reports abuse in their childhood. Um, which is certainly an overrepresentation among the general population. Physical abuse is the most prevalent form of abuse that's reported. Uh, slightly, but not very, I mean, almost the same, a little bit less is verbal or psychological abuse. And then sexual abuse is about 25 to 30 percent. Huh. So there does seem to be an overrepresentation, certainly, of abuse in the childhood of, of, of serial killers. And what's the baseline, just for point of reference, in terms of the general population, in terms of either physical abuse or, or sexual abuse as a child? Uh, you mentioned, I think, 76 percent and about, you know, 25, 30 percent. What is it in the overall population? 
you know, I think it depends on what kind of abuse you're talking about. So I think when you're talking about sexual abuse, you know, you can read some pretty horrendous statistics, you know, one every out of every four girls, for example, will have some kind of sexual victimization in her lifetime, not necessarily incest or right. from, you know, from childhood, but at some point um, about one in 10 men will experience that um, right. physical abuse, I would guess, you know, 25%. Um, so it's, it's, it's yeah, not it a, sadly, it's not a small number, but it's way different than when you're yeah. talking about 75, 76%. You know, I ran across, I worked in prison. I think I mentioned that earlier. And, you know, it's really some of these questions seem so easy to answer and yet they aren't always easy to answer and and one of the stories I like to tell is um I can remember when I would go in and do my assessment and, and with with different inmates and I would ask them about have you ever been physically abused no have you ever been sexually abused no you know and then later on you'd be talking to this person and they'd be talking about getting knocked out by a step parent or whatever and you'd kind of be like like you know I'd kind of like be like did we just have this conversation about abuse? And one of the things I realized is just how much children, which we, we know we've all been children, your background, your upbringing is often normal to you. And so right. I learned pretty quickly how important it was to ask about very specific behaviors as opposed to this idea where you abuse. And so I think it's, we do have some pretty good statistics, but I do think it's important to keep that in mind that we're going to have to, you know, we have to be sure that we're measuring the right thing because yeah. we tend to yeah. think of things as normal in our family until we learn otherwise. There's actually a question from the audience. Uh, it asks, is the triad test still being used to predict serial killers? I don't know what that is <laughs> to you. I do. You have a very sophisticated audience, which does not surprise me at all. Of course, um, the McDonald triad uh, was basically um, a theory. I think it was back in the 60s um, that when it first came out saying that these kind of hallmarks of or red flags of future serial killers basically was uh, excessive bedwetting, bedwetting past the age of maybe 12 or six, whenever bedwetting typically stops, um, animal cruelty and fire setting. And so right. these were kind of called the McDonald triad. And it was, you know, for a while there, there was this belief that if these things are, are prevalent, then, you know, it's the red flag waving, you know, jumping up and down. And what we found out is that, well, not exactly. So there is some basis to some of these, meaning that bedwetting, I think we can pretty much throw out the window yeah. uh, because there's all kinds of physical reasons that people might bed wet for many, many years. And, you know, so bedwetting does not seem to hold up at all. Um, fire setting depends upon the context. Many kids experiment with fire. So then it becomes, what does that mean? Fire setting? Um, you know, if you have somebody who's do, repeatedly doing arson, probably at past the age of 10, that certainly would be a red flag that something is up. What they found particularly with, with fire setting, repeated fire setting, as well as animal cruelty, is that these certainly are um, concerning and they're oftentimes the hallmark of trauma, of some kind of trauma. Now, most of the people that I've interviewed who are violent offenders, which I've interviewed probably thousands at this point in time, by far the majority of them would say, I would never hurt an animal. Some of them would say I'd hurt a person before I'd hurt an animal. And they're horrified by that, the thought of that. Again, we find animal cruelty at the same time overrepresented among serial killers. It, there is some truth to the fact that people sometimes start with animals huh. and they then progress to children. So, you know, I, I sometimes have parents desperate who call me and say, you know, my 10 year old, um, just stabbed our cat. Wow. And that is a concern to me. I mean, that is, you know, so there are some norms, right, about how how children view animals. I mean, you know, to say a three-year-old is pulling a tail of a cat, well, you know, children to a certain age tend to think of animals as toys almost. They can't really understand the difference. Right. But there's no question at a certain point when you have a child who clearly intellectually understands, you know, that this is wrong, that this this animal has feelings and begins to experiment on an animal or torture an animal is something that is clearly um, problematic. And it typically does indicate some kind of trauma. So for example, when you have a, a severe domestic violence situation where you have a perpetrator who is, you know, beating up the wife, maybe hitting the children, 
abusing the animals and you have a child who starts doing that, you're going to look and evaluate, okay, what's going on in this family that this child is mimicking that. So it definitely calls for intervention. If you have a child who's again, over the age of, of 10, who's doing these kinds of things, but it does not mean that this somebody is necessarily a psychopath or that they're destined to a life of serial homicide. Right. Um, now, of the 30% or so serial killings that you said are uh, motivated by sex, at least amongst men, um, how often do the perpetrators graduate, so to speak, from being rapists or serial rapists to, you know, going on to uh, killing? Is there usually a progression or do they usually just straight out of the gate go straight to killing? There usually is a progression. So oftentimes, for example, you will have somebody who um, might start out peeping in windows, um, you know, with people not seeing them, um, might um, begin engaging in exhibition, might engage in fetish burglaries or going into a house or stealing underwear and those kinds of things. It then graduates to fondling somebody in the subway or, you know, and it can kind of, it certainly can escalate from there. But I think it's important, you know, this idea of sexually motivated serial killing can become very, very confusing because there are, for example, sexually motivated murders who really are very motivated by the sex and they eliminate a witness. The murder is really about eliminating a witness. Right. Then you have sexually motivated serial killers who, what they're really motivated for is the dominance and control. They just want to have this person completely under their control. They might be, ha have a paraphilia such as sadism. And so what they're getting off on is not the murder per se, it's the torture in seeing this person in pain and, you know, and being degraded and hurt and those kinds of things. Um, and then you might have somebody who's just, you know, eliminating a witness. I've right. done this thing. So it's important, I think, sometimes to really look at the sequence of events and how they occur to try to tease out, you know, is this really a sexually motivated murder or is this something else? Is this about domination? Is this about control? Yes, it might take, it might be confused with sex and sex might be one avenue to humiliate this person, but it isn't necessarily about sex per se. Now, one thing about the root causes of uh, serial killing that I found fascinating in your book was the statistic about what percentage of serial killers have suffered head trauma. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? That is certainly something that I think we have been late to the game. And I say we, I think researchers and psychologists have been kind of late to the game and really recognizing um, how prevalent that is. About 20% of serial killers have some documented head trauma. And, you know, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean that people who've had a head trauma are at risk of becoming serial killers? Well, no, it doesn't necessarily mean that. But one of the challenging things when we're talking about serial killers is that we can look at one serial killer, we can kind of trace back that person's you know neurodevelopment, their childhood, uh, their personality, their coping styles, the protective factors, and we can start seeing patterns in that particular person. But it's so hard to then take those patterns and see them in other people. And, you know, it's like we can, we've, we've kind of gotten to the point where we can start understanding this person, but there's such a diversity. And so one of the things we do know is there is some correlation between head trauma. And there have been some cases, um, I think, not the norm, but there've been some cases where people have reported this person or this child was a pretty happy-go-lucky, normal child, not aggressive, and they had a head injury. Um, they were hit by a car. They were knocked out for a significant period of time. And um, their behavior, their personality changed or their behavior changed after that. And so it's not like necessarily that, you know, the head trauma the trauma of the head trauma caused it as much as perhaps this had some brain damage. And so it, you know, maybe their frontal right. lobe was damaged in this thing. And so there just this, the part of our brain that help is responsible for decision-making and judgment and inhibiting behavior gets right. damaged. And so you start seeing more aggression and those kinds of things. Well, so speaking of that, I mean, I assume it's the case that virtually every serial killer would probably be deemed a psychopath or a sociopath. Um, what percentage of serial killers are found to have a, a mental illness other than, you know, psych psychopathy, um, you know, schizophrenia, mm -hmm. delusions? Mm -hmm. How often is that a factor? So about 40 percent of serial killers have received some psychiatric diagnosis in the past. Now, that is not necessarily teasing out 
some of the other personality disorders and those kinds of things. It's very, very difficult. Uh, but I will tell you, it is very rare um, to see a serial killer whose serial killing appears to be due to some severe mental illness. And when I'm talking about a severe mental illness, I'm talking about schizophrenia. I'm talking about bipolar disorder. I'm talking about schizoaffective disorder or major depression, things that we as psychologists kind of distinguish. Here's a severe mental illness versus a mental health disorder. Um, such as panic attacks or anxiety or those kinds of things, or the personality disorders that we're talking about. Right. So there have been very rarely, um, there was a, a serial killer named Mullins who years ago developed this delusion that there was going to be this catastrophic earthquake and that he, in order to prevent millions of people from dying, had to make sacrifices um, and if he made these human sacrifices, that somehow he would prevent, um, you know, this catastrophic earthquake. So it was kind of like the, choosing the lesser of two evils. Right. And this is somebody who had a mental health history before he began killing, which is a key, right? Because, you know, sometimes you have serial killers who claim insanity after they've been caught and you kind of go, it's, you know. So you're saying that you were kind of going along just fine and then all right. of a sudden you develop this horrible mental illness that caused you to do these things. That's a tough one, right? That's a tough one to swallow. Um, and this person really did claim, to, did seem to be psychotic and seem to be operating in this delusion. Huh. And I had a colleague, as a matter of fact, who he's been in prison now for many, many, many years. I had a colleague who actually visited him a few years ago and said he is as psychotic as he ever was. Wow. But the jury... I think was so afraid that if they found him not guilty by reason of insanity, that he might get out at some point Right. that even given, you know, this, this very unusual um, case where he really did seem to be operating under this delusion. They just, they just were too afraid to do it. So they found him, him guilty. So it is very, very rare. Now we know that there's some, there is some connection between some specific symptoms of um, severe mental illness, not diagnosis, but symptoms. Um, so for example, um, paranoia, there's some connection between paranoia, acute paranoia and violence, which kind of makes sense. If I think people right. are trying to hurt me, I may right. hurt you in self-defense thinking that you're trying to, you know, you're trying to hurt me. Um, there's some, um, you know, thought insertion, somebody's trying to take over me, um, command hallucinations, I'm hearing these voices telling right. me I have to do these. An example of that would be, I had a, a client uh, several years ago who, this is actually, it was right after 9-11 and he had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And, um, you know, a couple of years before that, he was driving down the road. He wasn't taking his medication. And in the middle of I-5 in San Diego, he looks over and sees uh, somebody driving who was dressed in, Middle Eastern wear or whatever. And here's this voice that this person is on the way to the San Diego airport to basically hijack a plane and oh, really? continue what had just happened you know, to our country. And so he rammed this poor man off the road. I mean, literally just ran up person off the road. And, you know, when they got off the side of the road was kept ramming his car. Um, luckily, nobody was hurt. And wow. this individual did get on medication and, and was completely, you know, was on medication and was completely fine. But there's an example of somebody who in his mind, he's a hero, right? He's thinking he's being a hero. He is now saving another plane from crashing into another building and, and, and hurting a lot of different people. Those are pretty rare situations. Yeah. And of course, they have nothing to do with serial killing, but but there is some overlap. But when you're talking about serial killing, which is, is almost always premeditated yeah um, it's very very difficult to say that because of whatever because of my severe mental illness i you know kind of came up with this plan right? right to murder not just one person but murder more than one person over time you know speaking of serial offenders it's not about serial killers but i think it's important to spend a minute or two talking about this you talked in your book about uh rape and I think we have a uh, conception about date rape or acquaintance rape being sort of a different uh, type of crime as a, you know, stranger rape or, or, or violent rape. But you had an interesting statistic about 
what percentage of acquaintance rapes are actually committed by serial offenders? Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, you know, this was absolutely astonishing to me. And this was a relatively recent study because there has always been this kind of belief that date rape or acquaintance rape is very separate and very distinct from stranger rape. Somebody who stalks you down the street, snatches you, you know, out of your car and, you know, drags you into the bushes and sexually assaults you or breaks into your home and you wake up in the middle of the night terrified with this person standing over you. Um, and and there's a couple of studies that came out recently that basically found two things. One was very heartening that very, very few men call this is these are college men that they're studying as an easy group to study. Um, very, very few college men had ever, uh, you know, date raped anybody or, you know, raped somebody they knew was unconscious, knew that somebody was so drunk they couldn't make you know basically remember things and those kinds of things but that the people who did tended to do it over and over again yeah. and and because you know a lot of times um understandably when they're talking you're when you're, if you're a defense attorney you're going to be saying hey this is the person who made a mistake maybe this person thought that well maybe, maybe it was a he said she said that's right. one defense or you know maybe this person just made a mistake they were out there he was drunk she was drunk and this kind of happened and there are situations that do happen like that but it was pretty alarming to read again that it seemed to be a very small percentage of these college men who were in some respects doing this over and over again and setting it up that way yeah. so you know it was a premeditated thing and a, and a significant minority not majority minority of them continued and, and kind of graduated to being serial rapist once they got out of school wow um well so uh i'm gonna ask uh i'm switching gears a little bit but i'm gonna ask a question it's bizarre but you know silence of the lambs is probably the most well-known uh, of the movies out there about serial killers. And obviously Hannibal Lecter was an infamous fictional cannibal. Um, how often does it happen that serial killers eat their victims? You know, that was something I literally saw your question. I was like, okay, I think I know the answer to this, but I have to look this up because I research serial killers all the time with the ultimate goal of prevention. That really is my goal. And I think it hopefully yeah. does most people. You want to look and kind of go, okay, where did this start? Where are the roots of this? What are the early signs? How can we intervene so we don't get over here? Um, so the percentage of serial killers who engage in cannibalism is extremely low. It's between two and 5%. Um, tends to happen among sexually motivated serial killers. Mm -hmm. Um it, tends, it happens sometimes with people with these paraphilias, which your audience probably is aware of what that means. But just in case there's one person who does not, you know, paraphilia is what we consider to be a kind of a deviant sexual interest, yeah. which, of course, is subjective. Right. You look at our DSM manual over time and you see that different things have been considered deviant or not deviant, depending upon the times in which you lived. Um, and the ones that, you know, I'm concerned about as a forensic psychologist are the ones that can hurt people. Um, because if you have two pe people who are consenting adults, then you can figure out how you want to handle your relationship sexually and, and how you do this. Right. Um, but there are certain paraphilias, such as pedophilia, which it's difficult to find ways to do that in a law abiding manner. Right. Necrophilia, you know, which is interest in, in people who's dead, people who are dead is another paraphilia that, you know, sadism. Um, by definition, somebody who's interested in sadism, they don't want consent. It's right. the lack of consent that's kind of the turn on. And right. so those are the paraphilias that I'm, you know, that I worry about and I'm concerned about. And those are the ones that we tend to see when we're talking, not pedophilia per se, but some of the more dangerous or the paraphilias that can become dangerous that can lead to serial murder. And of those victims who've been uh, targeted or attacked by a serial killer, but have managed to survive, what do we know about how they survived or what strategies seem to be more successful than others? Well, first of all, you know, one of the really big gifts that I got from researching some of the things in my book was just the courage that so many victims have had, not only in or in families of victims, not only in terms of being willing to the ones who have escaped, who've gone to police and who've been just absolutely critical in stopping that person 
from further harm or yeah. family members who have passed laws that have, you know, closed loops where people can kind of get away, um, you know, from, you know, can, can maybe, maybe not get parole or risk right. assessment is done and those kinds of things. Um, so now I'm forgetting what you just asked. So, about, but so what are the actual strategies? What has Oh, worked? okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank escaped. you for thank you for getting back on track. No so problem. they're actually, I'm only familiar with one study that um, was done out of Germany. This man really did what kind of say, okay, um, first of all, we're more likely to be struck by lightning than we are to be attacked by a serial killer. But if that happens, it, it has happened and people have died from it. So what is the, what are your best odds? Yeah. And it was somewhat of a depressing um, result because what he found, he went back basically and looked at ones who had escaped. And what he found was by far most victims who escaped did it before they got to somebody's house. In other words, they refused to leave. They jumped out of a car. They ran. Yeah. What they found, and that's so, you know, it's so heart heartbreaking to me in a way, because, you know, some, so many times somebody's told, I'm going to kill you if you don't get in the car, or I've got a gun, or I'm going to do this. And, and, and time and again, you know, once that person has you under his control, the odds of him letting you go, go down astronomically. You know, um, you're just better off fighting, screaming, running, you doing whatever you can. Sometimes you can't. Um, right. But and, and there have been, you know, there have been women who literally climbed out of a bathroom window. There was a woman, Robert Hansen was a serial killer out of Washington, who his hobby basically was kidnapping women, flying them out on his private plane and hunting them in the wilderness like they were animals it was just horrendous that was the base of a show i can't believe that's real oh yes it, it was very real it was just terrible I mean, he would just get these women and he would you know, rape them and do all kinds of things then again he would you know get them in his plane and do this and there was literally a woman who somehow managed to either break a window of his car or get out he was getting ready to fuel the plane and um you know ran screaming down the street and that's how he was stopped. Wow. Um, well, so I think there's a common perception that the average serial killer is much smarter than the average person. Is that true? It's not true. So, um, you know, we, we, we do think of Anthony Hopkins, who was fantastic in Silence of the Lambs, but was not an accurate uh, picture of, thank goodness, right, of how most serial killers operate. There's some interesting, I, I thought, very, very interesting data when you look at intelligence and serial killers. Um, because, you know, we have the bell curve when we're talking about intelligence. So most people fall kind of in that average range, and then it gets smaller and smaller as it goes out. And so what we find is that the average or the, you know, the average IQ is, a, is about 92. So low average to average is if you kind of put them all together and averaged it out. Well, what does that tell you? It kind of tells you that most as a group, that serial killers are not necessarily in the gifted and tag program in their, you know, in their, in their school. Um, and yet what's also interesting is that we tend to find more people at the ends of the continuum that you would expect. So you have more serial killers who are at the higher end, and you also have more serial killers than you would expect based on how that bell curve normally works at the lower end. Um, and so, you know, what does this mean? You know, one of the first classifications of serial killers was this idea of disorganized versus organized serial killer, right? Yeah. The disorganized serial killer was the, the serial killer who would snatch you out of the bushes. It was a crime of opportunity. Uh, that person might pick up a rock and hit you over the head, bludgeon you to death, leave you out in the open, make no attempt to clean up the crime scheme. It's kind of a disorganized. And yeah. so there was this kind of theory that this person was somebody who was of lower intelligence. And so they weren't very organized. They probably were not very socially skilled because they didn't trust themselves to talk somebody into uh, you know, a car or a date or whatever. And then the other extreme being the smooth talker who woos that victim, whether it's smooth talking them interpersonally, whether it's like Ted Bundy used to do putting a cast on their arm or using crutches and appealing for help or those kinds of things. So we do find that there seems to be now this idea of organized versus disorganized has been somewhat 
debunked in the sense yeah. that most serial killers were organized to some extent. Right. You'd have to be to get away yeah. with it more than once. So, um, but you definitely see some gamut there. And the ones who um, are tend to be more intelligent are the ones who are uh, more likely to strangle, for example, less likely to bludgeon somebody over the head, uh, more likely, certainly probably the highest level IQ if you're trying to match um, victim we or, or weapon with IQ, bomb makers is probably no surprise, are probably the ones at the highest end, like intelligence wise. Speed. Exactly. And right. then the ones again, who are at the lower end are the ones who are more likely to use their fist and beat somebody to death or pick up a rock, use something at the scene. So we right. do find this kind of greater representation at, at the ends of the continuum. But it is certainly not true that most serial killers are geniuses who speak five languages and have a fine palate in terms of their food and all the things that we saw Anthony Hopkins. And do most serial killers or do many want to get caught? Like we always have the idea that they leave telltale signs or, you know, what ends up catching them? Is it that they left some clue intentionally or how do they end up getting caught? Well, that's an easy one. Um, no, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I can't think of any serial killer that I've read about or known. Now, now there was one serial killer whose name is escaping me right now, who actually did turn himself in wow. and he did seem to agonize it. You know, it, it seemed to be kind of a compulsion for him um, to commit these murders. And he, he did seem tortured by this and he did eventually go in and confess and he had a victim ready to kill and, and let her go. So again, oh. you're always going to find an exception because we're all human beings at the end of the day, no matter what we do. Um, but I think this idea of serial killers wanting to get caught comes about for two reasons. Uh, and it's a myth. One is they become sloppy a lot of times over time. And I think it's because they don't think they're going to get caught. Yeah. And so, you know, and oftentimes by that point, they have uh, some evidence for it. They've committed three murders, they've committed four murders, and they haven't gotten caught. So, you know, they just become a little bit sloppier. And then the other thing is the way in which some of them were caught. Um, so, they, yeah, they get kind of cocky, as one of your uh, one of your uh, one of our listeners said, um, they get kind of overly, you know, I'm the smartest person in the room, they're not going to catch me. Right. And then you look at some of the dumb ways that some of them have gotten caught. And you kind of go, are you are you kidding me? I mean, you know, getting pulled over for a for speeding and having a victim in your car. I mean, or you know, getting a parking ticket because you parked by a fire hydrant, or you know, leaving your glasses at the scene. I mean, there's just been some kind of really incredible ways where these people are spending hours fantasizing about their victims and how they're going to do it, and then they are speeding down the street, going sixty miles an hour in a twenty you know, 20 mile hour zone. So there've been these kind of ridiculous ways, again, yeah. luckily for all of us. And I think that is what's given that some legs, that kind of myth that, well, they must have, because who would be that stupid? You know, it's like, well, they there were. you go. Yeah, this person. Yeah. And in terms of the judicial system, you know, we talked, you talked about the case where the jury didn't want to acquit someone who probably clearly was insane because they were afraid of him eventually getting out. How often do serial killers plead not guilty by reason of insanity? And how often is that defense successful? So serial killers plead insanity about 5.5% of the time. So it's relatively low yeah. that they attempt that. Um, it's often a Hail Mary. Uh, in, in other words, there's so much evidence against me that I have nothing to lose here. Right. Of that 5.5%, um, 82% are found guilty. It does not work. So I'm really familiar with one. I've heard there's two. I can't think of the other one, but Ed Gein, who it was, as we're just talking about, uh, Hannibal Lecter, um, the, you know, the bad guy in, in this movie was based on Ed Gein. And so in Silence of the Lambs, also he was, I think, the model for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He's really been this kind of, you know, prototype of a serial killer for several different movies. Um, and he really was, uh, I think, very severely mentally ill and was found not guilty by reason of sanity and spent his life in a mental institution. Right. And I think a lot of people don't realize that that usually is the outcome when someone is found not guilty by reason of sanity. They usually don't ever get out, right? Um, yes, they usually don't. I mean, 
abs- in, in this situation, it's it would be mind boggling to think that yeah. this is somebody yeah. who would get out, somebody who multiple who murdered multiple people over time, and was doing all kinds of horrible things. So we've only got a few minutes left, and there's so much I'd love to talk about. But a couple of things I want to make sure we get to. One is probably the most recent high profile serial killer, Rex Huerman, the the Long Island killer. How did how many people did he kill, and how did he finally get caught? Well, you know, I guess to date, we could say that Rex Tuerman technically killed nobody. And I'm only saying that because right. he has Fair not enough. gone to trial. Yes. So he has not been found guilty of killing anybody. But allegedly. Uh, ele- yeah. Um, well, ele- so allegedly he has he has been charged with three murders. He is the prime suspect in another murder. There were these four women who anybody who's followed this case, they were known as the Gilgo Four because they were kind of placed pretty close together. They were wrapped similarly. They had a lot of similarities. And so there's always been the belief that these four victims were probably connected because yeah. of the similarities in terms of who that you know they were also very petite women they were of the similar age they were working as sex workers um you know there was a lot of similarities there um, they've also found you know all together 10 bodies um that and some of them are different so there's eight women that have been located there's also um a toddler a little a toddler girl, and there's also an Asian man who's been found. And so we don't know if he's connected. There seems to be some fairly strong evidence, and this is something that we're reading in the media. I don't have any inside scoops. So everybody who's watching this, um, and and as one of your one of our viewers pointed out, or listeners pointed out, um, you know, it was kind of odd that Shannon Gilbert, whose murder is still not solved, who was a sex worker who went missing, um, and and literally people were looking for her, and you know, ended up stumbling upon this graveyard of just victim after victim. He's also been more very recently, um, the attorney for Shannon Gilbert's family has come forward and he has claimed that there have been four new witnesses that have come forward who have uh, allegedly potentially tied Rex Hurman to Shannon Gilbert and to another victim, Karen Vergata, who was a recently ad- identified woman. So that this case is such a moving case yeah. and we don't know um, really what the outcome is going to be. There's a lot of alleged evidence tying him uh, at least to three and four. I'm going to say yeah. four of the victims, you know, yeah. everything from burner phones to, you know, making contact with some of the family members, tracking them. I mean, there's a lot of evidence, DNA evidence, um, right. potentially. So there's a lot of evidence to support these allegations, at least for these three. And he's another example of someone, right, rather than the idea of a serial killer who's a loner and, and a, you know, an outcast, right? He was sort of hiding in plain sight. He was an architect, right? Prominence. Um, really shows that our preconceptions about serial killers may not be accurate. Um, one final topic I want to touch on in our last few minutes, and I, I know it's a big one, but I'd like to get your thoughts on this. So um, all of the media attention that is focused on serial killers and, you know, social media, as well as, you know, traditional media, all the, the true crime, uh, you know, shows and, and, and other works that are out there, do you think that that contributes to the problem? Do you think it's helped us catch killers? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, is there a C, like all of the above? <laughs> because yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I I do. I mean, it's it's interesting because I'm so glad you brought this up. We were talking a little bit before we started today about just the ethics of true crime. And it's so important, I think, for people, and let me include myself certainly in this, to be very, very victim-centered um, to be very clear about the purpose of the research that I'm doing and how it's used to be sensitive to families um, and victims' families. And so, you know, I think I think for a long time, there have been some very valid questions raised about true crime and covering true crime and how we do cover true crime and where the lines are in terms of what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. I think we're still trying to sort that out. So on the one hand, I've always been a very big supporter for the most part of people who are true crime fans because I felt like they were engaged for the most part in trying to do good and trying to help. We know that some critical evidence in some cases has come about because of some true crime fans who on their own discovered things. So that's the positive part of things. 
The other side of it, I think, has just been there have been some really unfortunate, um, you know, families or victims feel like they're being stalked, which is horrendous. Things being leaked, people being falsely accused mm. without there being any, you know, evidence whatsoever, rumors starting and those kinds of things. And so when I started doing my um, YouTube channel a few years ago, and I, I literally tend to post on there every couple of months. I really struggle with that and still do. And so the way I'm trying to handle that, that dilemma is to try to think of the story, which people are interested in as the beginning of a conversation about something else, you know, whether that, whether that leads to talking about victims' rights, talking about safety, talking about psychology and understanding, you know, what are the red flags of a child who's crying out for help? You know, what do you do when you have a 10 year old who's out of control and hurting people? And, you know, there's, there's so, one of the, one of the things I think that we don't talk about enough as psychologists and as mental health professionals is there's oftentimes limited resources for families. I mean, there are families whose child is, is engaging in very scary behavior and they're going from one person to the next. And, that person may need some kind of, you know, residential treatment. Where do you put a nine-year-old who's doing these kinds yeah. of things? And so there, there's a lot of bigger issues to tackle. So I'm, I, I think I'm in danger of getting on a soapbox, but which I don't want to do, but I do think it's very, very important to, to never lose sight of the victims and to only talk about the perpetrator. If it helps us either understand those earlier warning signs, um, you know, understand you know, something we can do differently um, yeah. going forward. And so I'm always open to information and ideas about that. I think that's a really important perspective. I'm, I'm glad you shared that. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. I would love to talk to you for hours about this. I know many of our audience members will as well, but um, we do have to wrap up. I want to thank you, Dr. Johnston. Um, incredible insights on a on a dark but truly fascinating topic. I want to thank all of you who took time out of your day to listen. I want to thank all those behind the scenes who uh, made this webinar possible. And I look forward to seeing you at our next Distinguished Speaker webinar. Thanks, thank everybody. you. And thank you. Thanks. Also, thank you for inviting me. And thank you for all the people who came and spent the time out of their day to listen. I really appreciate it. Thank you.